it would be in this era, the late 1920s, when the Western Maryland uh, expanded this line, and about halfway up the mountain, they bought the line of what is now the uh, Cassidy Railroad, the Greenbrier Cheetah and Elk, because that time they really started removing coal from this area, more particularly on top of Chee Mountain and down the other side into the Elk River Valley. And so we, uh, it'll be 1930 when the Western Maryland takes over the trackage of the Greenbrier Cheetah and Elk River. And at that time, of course, the cast of the uh, paid the Western Maryland for the use of the railroad actually they have built. Uh, you'll see uh, very good evidence of this later on, and I'll explain when we get up to the uh, above Bemis, when we come to the high bridge, and you'll see very good evidence of how the differential of the railroad and what they were trying to accomplish, how it manifested itself in a very weird looking track layout. We'll see if I can't handle that when we get up there. You might see a little flat spot, a little evidence of a siding, but the only communities that really exist now are Faulkner, Bowden, and up at Bemis. Just about all the others are, are gone. A good example would be the next crossing you hear our train blowing for. It was called Meadows. There was a, a large mill there in 1905, 1906 era. Later on, about 1911, the Brown brothers put a bridge and started lumbering the other side with their own railroad. And in the wintertime, you can see some of the bridge abutments, but now there's a couple homes down there, some nice ones, but other than that, you would never know they've been quite an operation down here in a place called the Meadows. Anyway, back at this next crossing, which we'll be approaching here just in a moment. Some of the others include places like Woodrow, Kite uh, Curve, and the uh, Montees. These places no longer existed. I have a postcard from Montees 1907, and today, well, you might see a bridge abutment there where the Western Maryland took a spur across, but that's all that is there. Most of these places are long gone. Today, of course, they are recreational houses for the most part. When they get down to the very bottom of the hill, when you get to the Faulkner and Bowden area, then you'll see what today's real business is in these parts, namely recreation and trout fishing. The Shaver's Fork of Cheat is one of the premier trout fishing strains for the state of West Virginia. In fact, the state still operates a fish hatchery there at Bowden. That fish hatchery was originally built by the federal government in the late 1950s, but the state of West Virginia took it over in the 1990s, and it produces about 20% of the recreational fish that is the, uh, caught in the state of West Virginia. Now, the only trout that is native is the brook trout. The uh, two others you find now are the brown trout and, of course, the rainbow. The rainbow comes from the west coast of the, uh, or the uh, Rocky Mountain area of this country, and the browns come from Europe, namely uh, the British Isles. Of course, the brook is native to this state, and the, uh, the bound hatchery, as best of my knowledge, still produces all three times. The golden trout is not produced currently, at least that we know of, here at the Bowden Hatchery.
track we're on now was built in 1930-31, and it was built to connect the uh, cast line directly with the, uh, the Western Maryland line. The original line swung to our right, then came across the bridge, and literally crossing this track. You'll see that bridge to our right here in a second, and you actually see where the old crossovers were to the right. They're laying on the track. And the original track went down the river almost to the uh, Bemis before making another horseshoe turn going back into the mountain through tunnel number two. We're just a little over a mile from the uh, stopping at the High Falls of Chief. What we'll do, we'll stop up here at the High Falls. Uh, you'll be getting out of the first car uh, right by the engines, and we'll stop about 25, 30, 30 minutes. Uh, we'll give you about a five minute warning when we want you to board. We'll blow the, uh, the diesel, the diesel horn, and when you hear that big blast of the horn, you need to be uh, working your way back or pretty much on the train by then. About 25 minutes, 30 minutes is about what we normally stop up here at the High Falls. Now we have to walk up to the top. There we have a little pavilion and some picnic tables up there. If you want to see the high falls itself, you have to take a path over the hill. Now there is a path there, but if you're not a real short foot or maybe you're faint of heart, you may want to consider not going down there because it is a path, even though we have worked it out. We can either go a path to above the falls or take the one to the lower falls. But we have some of the uh, outhouse restrooms. Of course, we can always use the ones on the train as well. But there is a pavilion up here and some picnic tables. And we should have some company. When we get up here, we should see the Chief Mountain Salamander. That is that yellow rail bus I'm talking about. Of course, we're running a little bit late today, but he still should be there. I don't think he's left yet. So you get a chance to see the uh, Edwards motor car that had come down from Chief Ridge. Of course, if he isn't there, he, we just missed him. We wouldn't have missed him by much. Anyway, we're closing in on the High Falls of Chief. Again, we'll be uh, debarking from the coach immediately behind the locomotive. That's the 537 and the forward end of the train. except the governor. And since we're going downhill, I don't worry about that. <laughs> Try to let him do the braking, but we need the brake. Oh, I've got the, the, the train brake, the airline brake right here. So how many miles is it to you? We got back up a little over five miles down to that siding. Uh-huh, okay. We're going to redo the siding up here around the corner here uh, by the end of this year.
Okay. Hopefully. Where the sweet was there? Oh, back here at Bemis? No, that right up here in front of where we stopped. Oh, that's not a switch, that's a derail. Okay. That breaks our railroad down into two parts. This is under total control of the FRA, Federal Railroad Administration, where above that it's a tourist line. It's, it's technically a attached, unattached railroad, okay. which means nothing to us, but means everything to CAS. <laughs> that allows, allows CAS to keep those the, uh, shades on the road, because if they had to meet modern standards, they would never pass. I notice it looks like you have some, uh, what, flange greasers on the track? Yes, they're Western Maryland, and half of them work. Uh, yeah, okay. What triggers them to work? They're just, the flanges come through and operate a spring mechanism. Oh, squirt. Okay. So you really got to have a long train to get them working. If you go by a couple axles, by the time you get pumped up, they don't work that great. But if you have a cold train, it's a different situation. You got to have the grease on the side. You don't want the grease on the top, but you've got to have the grease on the side of the rail. You really have a lot of wear and tear. It's hard to keep it just on the side, not getting on the top, and vice versa. It gets on the top, and you have major problems when it rains. <laughs> it gets greasy. We've had it so greasy, the uh, Edwards car can't get above spruce one time. It just couldn't make it. We had to go clean the rails. But we're, but we're, yeah, we're coasting down here. Now, I heard you say that those are re-engined, that there's a GP38 engine in there, or a power supply? Oh, yeah, the, uh, on the, yeah, yeah it's re-powered. Some say it's a GP38. We're approaching your first little curve, 67. Now, is this where you would put that sighting in that you talked about? Yeah, this is point sighting, where it used to be. Okay, and this is what you would put in so you could run that's, the engine? That's good shape. Yeah, we want to put this back in service. Okay. And that allows us to run around right here, which will make, save a lot of grief. What's your speed restriction when you're going in reverse like this? There is no speed restriction. Oh, is it? I mean, commuters do it all the time at 80 miles an hour. Yeah, but usually there's an engineer in the, in the cab. The engineer. You're the engineer now, I see. Well, we got two engineers. But I mean, basically, that's your role as the engineer at yeah. this point. Okay. I'm saying, I think I technically don't have this. I don't have a throttle control. You don't have the throttle, but you have the braking control. Yeah. And our speed limit is 29 miles an hour anyway on the whole railroad because we don't have the uh, speed recording equipment. Oh, I see. So 29 is fast as we can and 20 over on public crossing because we don't have ditch lights. Okay. So any other speed restrictions are really not germane anyway. Then we have some uh, track orders out on these curves here and some standing. Slow orders out on my sign. Now uh, I heard yesterday that you guys run on train orders, right? Yes. Does someone write an order for this train every every time it runs, or is it like a blanket order out? Uh, it's not a blanket order; it's a weekly order. Weekly. Because it's because they are scheduled trains. You just say you have permission to be on the track this day between these hours and these hours, between this spot on the track and that spot on the track. And we just run through that. Do you ever run more than one uh, movement at a time? Like, uh, do you ever run freight and uh, the excursion? Right now, we don't have the power to do that. We have on special occasions. That's why with the train wars. Is that T6 operative? Yes. Okay, you're one car from the uh, tight curve. Oh, yeah, that's right. You're there. This is a 10 mile hour cool bar by rule. Okay, you're in a 10 mile an hour curve. Still, we should let him do the maneuvering and have me mess him up. So basically, your role is to throw it in emergency or something like that if yeah. you get a little out of control. And to keep people off from being run over. Right, well, that's true. Here. Back it down. Yeah. They can't hear us. Right. Yeah, that's my real role. But you do have a horn in this end. I think yeah. you just blew it, right? Folks, if you'll check the side of the right and the left of the side of the train, you can see some mountain laurel in bloom. That's where it is. Some mountain laurel. The big laurel is it now 
coming out in bloom. But the rodent engine will be about another week or a week and a half before it is full bloom. Big laurel coming out. Oh dear. Just starting. To oh yeah. Bloom. Most of the evergreens of this ever at this elevation are hemlocks and some hard pines. Yeah, your red red spruce, the primary red spruce is on top, higher up. Scattered throughout the territory. Now, what's your role on the railroad? I understand you're involved in a lot of things. It varies from day to day. Okay. I'm the uh, historian and normally the announcer Jerry today. Beach. Licensed engineer and conductor. And the, uh, I just do a lot of the auctioning substitutes. I'm one of the guys go anywhere on the railroad and do anything he wants done. I'm not certified yet for steam, but I'll be steam certified for this episode. So how do you get certified for steam? Uh, go through a uh, steam class, which I've had, safety class, and what the stuff is. Uh, then it's just an unofficial uh, apprenticeship from a guy out there who uh, has a steam repair facility up in Pittsburgh somewhere. And he comes down on the weekends and does stuff once he satisfied we can do what we're doing, I can take over up there because it's not FRA, that operation. So it's not like being out here on the railroad, like this railroad. Mm, I see. So when he thinks I know what I'm doing and will not tear up his engine, he'll certify me. Now this is Greenbrier Junction. This is where the old GC&E actually went on down this way and connected with the old coal and iron. Is that the right of way I see to the right there? Yeah. The original track would have gone there. Of course, the Western Maryland would have built the, up the hill, made the connection here. That's why it's got the name Greenbrier Junction. But originally, the GCNE went around and connected and went to Durban. Uh -huh. didn't, it didn't have any need to go to Elkins. But the Western Maryland wanted to haul the coal to the Elkins, so they built this connecting, which created the junction. But now the original's gone, and all it's left is the 1930s Western Maryland connection. This is what we're going over now. We just now left the GCNE. This is all right. This is all right. You're now back on the Western Maryland. It was never coal and iron. Then we cross the bridge, you're back on the coal and iron. The West yeah. Virginia Central has a total of 25 railroads. That's, that's a it's not one railroad. It's 25 of them. Yeah, count them right? the guys say, yeah. Do you guys have any type of historical society? No. We are becoming the ad hoc, informal, whatever you want to call it, Western Maryland Equipment Historical Society. All of the running Western Maryland equipment seemed to be finding its way to this railroad. Hey, that's okay. Which is fine by us. <laughs> this is really nice track that they got here. Oh, yeah, Western. All railroads fix up their physical property before they abandon it. That's how they take it to the committee meetings. We spent $5 million, $6 million just to put it on the books. Then they go, say, we're not making money. Then they right. abandon it. That's, yeah. that's why. Now there's some joint rail above us going uh -huh. up the cheap bridge. But from here on down, it's all ribbon rail. 130, 120 pound, 124 pound ribbon rail. It's great railroad. See, if we put a steam engine on this line, it has to meet all the federal guidelines, which would be expensive. Not so much running them or maintaining them, is doing the inspection work, the uh, x ray and all the engineering stuff. They do uh, because they're tough on that. Because this is a operating railroad because of our freight connection. So this line, if we kept on straight, would run right into cast on top of the hill. And that's what it was used for. Up at High Falls, that was the cast line. That was the Green Wire Cheat Elk. That's where the, the, the wood shays and the wood hicks, that was where they were. You're one car from the High Bridge 67. And not quite a half mile down the river, the track over there met the uh, GCNE to come through that cut. And that would have been Cheat Junction. Down here where the shortcut bypass started, the old line went around, would have been Elk River Junction. Even though it's Cheat River. Even though it's Elk River Junction, it is Cheat River. Because we had Cheat Junction, we had Greenbrier Junction, it was the only one that had left. So they named it Elk. It's great having those historian right here with us. <laughs> oh. 
Bank car is now open. We have hot dogs, hot coffee, soft drinks, sandwiches, pepperoni rolls, cookies and cakes, and a host of railroad paraphernalia. We're next two and a half miles. My biggest problem is people walking the track. Oh, yeah, I bet. Those are right above Bemis. Yeah. And the only way to get these fishing holes is to walk up or down the Bemis. Yeah. That's why you can do occasional stop in Bemis for people who camp there who've never walked up here because they're not fishermen. And so they just want to ride up. So are you saying that the stop at Bemis is primarily for uh, recreational people? Or? They said they have people who live in there and not necessarily fishing. They want to go up the high falls or someplace because they never walk. They uh, don't go fishing. They're not going to walk up the mountains to take a look at it. So we tend to get the ladies and the young kids. Right. While their husbands are out fishing. So it's a day out for them while their husbands are at the water? Yeah. Pretty much it. I was commenting how smoothly this car rides compared to the uh, motor car on the Salamander. Oh, the Salamander is a 1990s Edwards car, but it has all the qualities of the 1920s Edwards cars, believe me. <laughs> the only thing really different about it is the uh, power and the powertrain. Other than that, the guy made it just to the specs. You can tell. It. You can it's tell every joint on the railroad. Oh, and you go across the joint of railroad, oh, yeah. <laughs> it will beat you up. And it's, it's a but little that's noisy, too. Like. <laughs> guy wanted to build an Everest car, and it's got seats and stuff in there. It's 60, 70 years old. The door notches for the sliding door. I know it's the patent day on this, 1927. I don't know where he got those. He just built the car two years ago. There's nothing new on it. Believe me, there's nothing new on it. But who owns it? We do. Oh. It the last Edwards car ever built. We bought the company. The federal people didn't like it. That's another reason we put in the split rail. And he'll have to, if he builds any more, he'll need some money. But he's going to make some changes. The federal people just won't allow him to build 1920s. Oh, I see. Okay. But again, he's running on the tourist railroad rather than the class. What is it? Is it what is it? A class three railroad or? This is a class three railroad. Okay. Because class one, two, or three the same rules, and only this, the uh, the money involved changes the class. The rules don't change. Now, what class track is this? It's three. Is it? Because like I say class one, two, or three is simply a monetary uh, value of the company. It has nothing okay. to do with uh, any of the quality. Then you have uh, a couple other lines of uh, segregated lines, non-connected lines, tourist lines, and that kind of stuff. Ford 47, engine 67, that puts us uh, about two car or two train lengths away from the crossing here to So I have to stop the train. I'll take the crossing, we'll stop, and I'll go spotting, let my people walk, and I'll come back here for another two and a half miles. Where do these folks get their tickets? They call ahead, we stop, and they buy them on board. Oh. They still have reservations. We're four cars, four cars, 67 from the crossing. Again, I'll take over the crossing, then we'll stop, then I'll spot you. Three cars to cross. So that track that we passed back there, that turnout, that was to a, a mine? Yeah, a mine. A coal mine? Yes. Opened up in the late 20s. I couldn't have bought it. Senator Camden had all the property up here from Harvardburg. Yeah. Then my grandma took it over. Worked through the uh, war. Paid off the debts for everything we lost in the Depression. As soon as she paid off her debts, she got out of business. Yeah. Uh, we had coal uh, yards in Baltimore, and we had some money till the depression wiped down. Man. 
Why did you stop the train after you got the crossing? Because I needed people off. I wanted to let them off at the station. And he needed to be spotted at the, the uh, spot. Oh, so, so you got off the train to help do that? Yes, I, I'm I got there to uh, spot the train on the crossing. Right. Okay. On the, at the station. The oh, station. Right. Well, I never expected to ride with the engineer today. One of the pleasures of Western Union. You never know who you get. <laughs> I always wanted to ride in the cab. I didn't think it was going to be a parlor car. Well, if you want to ride in the cab, down Tiger, we'll get you up there. That's fine with me. I'll take the opportunity. We're at my post 45, just 67. This is a place called. This is Walker. The coal mine was up here, and it came down over us, loaded in the yard over here. There's a white building down there somewhere, right there. That's what's left of the powerhouse. And the anchors to the yard on both sides was taken out by the river in the 85 flood. Oh, were you one of the people who helped uh, restore parts of the railroad, rebuild it? Not technically. Yes, that was really on the Durban line, which I wasn't a part of at that time. Most of the major stuff here is done by the state of West Virginia. It's their responsibility. Oh, I see. That's right. You leased this. West Virginia Central leased yeah. it. We're responsible for the nuts and the bolts. Anything capitalized is their responsibility. Now, what's this mile pole that we're going to be uh, stopping at and running the engines around? 43 is the mile pole. And you're about a car away from the, uh, the switch. You need to slow down a little bit now. Basically, when you think you have the room around this curve, uh, you can stop anywhere you want to stop. Her. Do you have a name for this sighting? This is Woodrow. This, this used to be an old mill here at Wood, and they call it Woodrow Siding. The mill about 1912, somewhere in there. I'm surprised when these places disappear, they disappear totally. Yeah. Let's go ahead and take it around the curve, 67. That that way we're uh, coupling on flat or straight track. This is 4,000 foot siding. Oh, Roger. There's only two places coal trains could pass here and up on Spruce. So this is a long siding. It takes us a good 15 minutes to run around the train. It's 4,000 feet long. Yeah. So what was the tonnage limit on uh, the grades up to Spruce? I'm not sure what the tonnage limit was, but it was nine cars for every locomotive. Any place you get a stop, uh, 67. It was great talking with you. Thanks for oh, the information. Glad I could shed some light. So
Back in the siding, they're not taking them with them today. I'm on the rear. You're on the rear. 